This horse, Tappington Everard, called Tapton for short, is an antiquated but commodious manor horse in the English countryside of Kent. It was built by our ancestor, Sir Giles Inglesby, who was high sheriff to Queen Elizabeth. I myself am Tom Inglesby, 14th heir to this forbidding old house. Set on a grove of tall, dark trees, legends have sprung up about it that add gloom to its sinister reputation. One autumn weekend during the grass season, every guest room in the manor house was occupied. That is, every one except the oak chamber. Little did we know that the unexpected arrival of our distant cousin and good friend, Lieutenant Charles Seaforth, would cause the dark mysteries of that oak room to intrude themselves upon us in such a strange way. A telegram that morning had warned us of his arrival, that he was on leave, invalided home from India. So it was with glad surprise and open arms that I welcomed the young lieutenant to Tapton. Well, Charles, old chap, I say it is good to see you. <laughs> Hello, Tom. How are you? <laughs> back from the land of the Rajas, what? Welcome to Tapton. Thanks, Tom. It's good to be back in England and... Best of all, to be here with you and... Uh... And uh, Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> I know that mine are not the charms that bring you here, but those are my lively, lovely sister. Well, here's your childhood heartthrob almost falling down the stairs in her eagerness to greet you. Charles, Charles, my dear, how wonderful to have you here. Carolyn, you're lovelier than ever. Lovelier than I dreamed. May I kiss you? Of course, Charles. Oh, Charles, it must have been dreadful in India. <laughs> well, it... Was a bit of a show for a while. We uh, heard you were on the wounded list. Oh, just a tap on the old bean, a touch of fever, but I'm fit now. You look wonderfully well, Charles. Thinner, perhaps just a bit older. <laughs> a broth of a boy has come back to us a man, Carolyn, and what a man. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, dear, we've had to put you in the oak room. Yes, as our housekeeper, old Bollersby, puts it, the house is choke full up. I uh, hope you don't mind, old boy. Oh, why should I mind? Sounds very important, really. Uh, is it an attic nook? Oh, no, it's the guest chamber. Or always was until some rather weird stories began Oh, Tom, began not to... now. What? Sorry. What we mean, Charles, is simply that the oak room is very old. Oh, but I love old rooms and old houses. Oh, what a magnificent hall. This tapton of yours is a baronial beauty. A perfect setting for good old Queen Bess. <laughs> I can almost see her ghost moving along up there on the gallery and wafting majestically down the don't, stairs. Charles, please. What? We don't like to think about ghosts here. Oh? Is Tapton haunted? Well, I'm afraid we've had our moments. Uh, no, as soon as I've shown you off to some of my guests, Charles, Carolyn and I will conduct you on a special tour of the premises. I'd like that nowhere. Good. Well, come along then into the library. I think you'll remember Jack Overton and Fanny Simpkinson and many of the others. Charles was fascinated by the old manor. We showed him every nook and cranny from gallery to scullery. Then, that evening after a good and jovial dinner, some of us were gathered around the library fire when the legendary specter of Tapton became the theme of the conversation. Did they show you the blood stain? Yes, it didn't look like blood to me, Fanny. But it is blood, Charles. Human blood. And for 300 years, no sandstone or soap has budged it. <laughs> Cheerful little antique. Did you take him into the glen, frowning darkly as of yore? Oh, not yet, <laughs> Jack. Oh, it's gruesome. Let's go there tomorrow before breakfast. All right. You know, they say the keeper's daughter was seen to enter it, but nothing was ever seen oh, again. Stop, <laughs> Fanny. You're breaking my heart. My nerves can't stand it. <laughs> she never was seen by mortal eyes again. Oh, never. <laughs> How did you uh, like the ancestral portraits? <laughs> Nightmarish old codgers, eh? Mr. Rogert and Sarah, you speak of me ancestors. <laughs> oh, sorry, old fellow, but you must admit Sir Giles is no rose. Yes, I've seen his like in horror films. What's his history, Tom? Well, dark and dismal tradition has it that his wicked licentiousness was above the average even for those days. What was his special vice? Murder. Oh, how thrilling. Who did he kill? Yes, tell us the story, Carolyn. Shall I, Tom? Go ahead. I'll turn off some of the lights. Tell the gory legend, sis. Scare them. Well, you asked for it, my friends. Here it is. One night, long, long ago, a stranger guest came to Tapton. Though he and Sir Giles met in apparent friendship, the scowl on the squire's brow showed the visitor to be unwelcome. Nevertheless, the banquet was not spared. The wine circulated freely. Too freely, perhaps, for the servants heard loud and angry quarreling. The stranger, cold menace in his voice, was heard to say that there were documents within his pocket which could disprove Sir Giles' right to Tapton. Documents that proved his inheritance? Oh, don't interrupt, Jack. Go on, Carolyn. Who was the stranger? Rumor was right. It seems the old retainers had heard talk in their youth that an heir who disappeared in early life had left a son in foreign lands. So... So you and Tom may not be the rightful owners of Tapton after all. Yeah, that's right. Some long-lost cousin from far-off lands may come to clear it. Sure. Huh? 
You're our distant cousin, Charles. And from a foreign land. Oh, oh now, I, I assure you, I have no documents in my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> but go on, go on with the legend. What happened? The revelers finished their party and sought their beds. The stranger fell into drunken sleep in the oaken chamber. In my room? Your room. <laughs> the next morning he was found, a swollen and blackened corpse. No marks of violence, but his lips were livid, and dark-colored spots appeared on his skin. The word poison was whispered, but no one dared say it aloud. I see. Was it murder? Sir Giles' personal leech pronounced it an apoplexy, and the nameless stranger was buried in haste. It's a ghastly story, Carolyn. Wait, I haven't told you the most curious part of the legend. Huh? The mysterious disappearance of the stranger's trunk. His trunks? His breeches, stupid. The supposed hiding place of the documents. Oh. His clothes were all there. Jerkin, waistcoat, cloak, but no sign of those puffed velvet short pants the Elizabethans wore. They say the evil one was in the oak room that night. And I am to sleep in this self-same oaken boudoir, huh? Well, how about ghosts? Oh, some miracle mongers have it that the ghost of Sir Giles has been slipping out by the postern gate to the glen. Searching and digging and wringing his hands. Did they ever find the britches? Well, uh, years ago, gardeners doing some work in the glen dug up an ancient garment with uh, bits of gold embroidery. And out fell some papers, perfectly illegible from damp and age. Did they really belong to the nameless stranger? Who knows? Perhaps they did. I've just been telling you the legend of Tatsy. <laughs> I must say, you've given me a fine build-up for a peaceful night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I shan't dare turn out the light in my room. Well, spooks or no spooks, it's early up in the morning, so I'm off to slumberland. <laughs> Ghostly dreams to you all. Oh, Good, Good night, night Benny. Good, Good night. night. <laughs> well, strange cousin from foreign lands, remember the legend. After all, you may be the real owner of the manor. Oh, rot. I, I don't want your old manor. If I can have its lady. Is this a proposal, Charles, dear? What do you think? Uh, I see this is my cue to exit. <laughs> good night, you love birds. Good night, Tom. And uh, it might be a good idea to lock your door, Charles. Thanks, I will, never fear. I myself wasted a few moments of healthy sleep, worrying lest Carolyn's story had disturbed my guests. But as far as I knew, a peaceful night had blessed old Tappington. And then... The next morning, as I was on my way down to breakfast, I was practically knocked down by our man McGuire bumping into me. Here, take it easy, McGuire. I'm sorry, sir. Lieutenant Seaforth really like one beside himself, sir. Well, go ahead and see what he wants. Carry on. Yes, certainly, sir. Sorry, sir. I followed McGuire to the landing and stood watching as he knocked on the door. Come in. Ah, McGuire, at last. Uh, yes, sir. Where are my trousers? Your, uh, your britches, sir? Yes. What have you done with them? Me, sir? I never offend, sir. Well, it must have been the devil, then. I put them on that armchair when I got into bed, and by heaven, now they're gone. Uh, would it be Miss Carolyn or Miss Fanny playing some sort of a joke, sir? Oh, not probable, McGuire. Not possible, in fact, because I locked myself in. Uh, wait. Is there any other entrance to this room? Well, there is the secret staircase to the postern, sir. Over there. Of course. That's the way they must have come. I'll go and see. Let's see here. No, no, no chance, McGuire. Two heavy bolts, both fastened on the inside. I must say it's all very strange. Funny it is indeed, sir. Funny, McGuire? No, not too funny. We had almost finished breakfast when Charles appeared. I noticed he wore immaculately tailored riding breeches, perfect for a day on the saddle, but scarcely the costume for our planned grass shooting. However, I made no comment, as his manner was so strange. He stood on smiling in the doorway of the dining room, staring at the girls. Carolyn seemed annoyed. Come, Charles, the tea is absolutely cold. Your breakfast will be spoiled. Why are you so late? Sorry? What became of our excursion to the Glen? Uh, when I was a young man, punctuality was required of all well When you were a young man, sir, young ladies didn't play practical jokes. Whatever are you talking about, Charles? Oh, don't mind me, Carolyn. I've just been made a fool of, that's all. Obviously, something was troubling Charles. Occasionally, he darted a penetrating glance at the girls... However, a glorious day in the field seemed to snap him out of this troubled mood. As a matter of fact, Charles took a leading part in planning the picnic we were to have the next day. There was no talk of ghosts nor any mention of legends. It had rained during the night and turned much colder. So you will understand the amazement it caused when Charles came down to breakfast next day in his uniform tropical shorts. Charles! 
You're surely not going to ride through our lanes in such toggery as that. You do surprise us with your costume changes. Well, what the well-dressed man will wear. <laughs> he thinks he's back in the jungle, that's all. Poor lad, he's quite balmy. <laughs> Look here, Uncle I'll thank you to... Heavens above, Charles. Won't you get very wet after all the rain? You'd better drive in the carriage with me. Thank you, Fanny. I'll ride as planned with my cousins. During this banter, Carolyn said not a word. I could see she was worried sick over Charles. However, the picnic was a great success. I wandered away from my guests because I, I wanted to be alone for a while and, and see if I could think out any reason for Charles' eccentric behavior. I was worried. Frankly worried that maybe his head wound had been more serious than he realized. I must have dozed off, for I was suddenly aware that I was an eavesdropper on my sweet sister Carolyn and her adored Charles. I started to speak, but... The tone of their conversation kept me silent. Carolyn, I know you mean these crazy trousers of mine. Well, you must admit they are a bit odd. Why ever did you wear them? I'm not wearing these wretched things because I want to be different. Carolyn, my dear, something strange is going on in the oak room. Pair by pair, my trousers are being stolen. Oh, Charles, dear, how simply fantastic. For heaven's sake, darling, you must be dreaming. Carolyn, please listen to me. I'm beside myself. I was not dreaming. The first morning, I thought McGuire had taken my trousers to press them. Then I even thought you girls or Tom were playing some childish joke on me. But night before last, and again last night, I saw the ghost. The ghost? Oh, Charles, this is too much. There isn't any ghost. You mean the specter? I mean just that. I saw the specter of Tapton, that bluebeard ancestor of yours. Sir Giles? Yes, Sir Giles. <laughs> walking in my bedroom with his velvet cloak, long rapier, and his Raleigh-looking hat and feather, just like his portrait. But there was one difference. What was that? His legs were the legs of a skeleton. Oh, Charles. After taking a turn about the room, seemingly looking for something, he, 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 he took up my britches and whipped his bony legs into them. Then he strutted up to the glass and studied himself. Why didn't you call out? I tried to, but I... I couldn't oh, somehow speak. Oh, my poor darling. It was an awful dream. It was no dream, Carolyn. It was definitely th the ghost. For then he, he turned and showed me the grimmest, most dreadful-looking death's head. It grinned hideously at me and, and then strutted out of the room suddenly. How ghastly. Oh, I blame myself, sir, for telling you that silly legend. It's given you these nightmares. This was no nightmare, Carolyn. But, dear, Tapton isn't haunted. You're just remembering that stupid story I told you. You never said one word about Sir Giles' ghost in the oak room. Not one word about his skeleton legs. Not one syllable Charles, about it. Oh, darling, you're overtired. You're talking rubbish. Carolyn, I expected sympathy and understanding from you. I'm not talking rubbish. I tell you, I saw the ghost. My britches are gone, vanished in thin air. And if the ghost didn't take them, who did? I had never thought seriously there could be a ghost at Captain. That legend Carolyn had told our guests that night had been intended as a joke more than anything else. In fact, since childhood, we have liked to spoof about our family spook. But it was evident that the story of Sir Giles had made a dreadful impression on Charles' mind. His strange costumes had merely amused us. But now, even our guests were beginning to wonder. Next morning, as we were lingering at the breakfast table over that last bit of muffin and jam... Ogleton said... I see. Uh, what makes Charles so touchy? He bolted from the room just now as if the old boy himself were after him. I'm sorry I giggled at him. But, Tom, I couldn't help it. Full dress uniform at breakfast. I see. Uh, <laughs> is it shell shock, Tom? I wish I knew. When I asked him why the fancy dress, he bit my head off. I can still, still hear him saying... It's the regimental dress of the Royal Bombay Lancers, Fanny. It was regal. Blue tunic, red striped trousers, and gold braid. <laughs> I haven't seen the like since the coronation. It wasn't funny to Carolyn, though. She was almost in tears when she ran after him. She looked positively stricken. Yes, my poor sister was teary-eyed all that miserable day. As for Charles, though he seemed to be making an effort to be more companionable, it only resulted in his being distantly polite. To add to my own distress in the matter, I learned that McGuire, the valet, had been kicking up quite a bobbery below stairs, boasting that on the evening before he'd seen a ghost. McGuire had overheard some of our conversations, but this cap trap about ghosts had to be stopped. So that night after our house guests had retired, I rang for McGuire. You rang, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, close the door. Uh, yes, sir. Now, see here, McGuire. What's this I hear about your having seen a ghost last night? Devil alive, will I tell your honor, but... 
Last night I saw a ghost. Oh, what rot. Don't spread such nonsensical stories. Where do you think you saw this thing? Well, sir, we went last night for a bit of a stroll to the Glen. We? Uh, myself and one of the maids, sir. Yes, that yes, is, yes. Get on, get on. To see the moon it was, sir. But we saw more than the moon, sir. In the shadows was a terrible ghost. What sort of a ghost, man? A tall gentleman he was, sir. All in white with a shovel on the shoulder of him and a big torch in his fist. Though what he wanted to do that is myself can't tell, for his great eyes were like big lamps. The maid screeched, haul him with her, and ran off with herself, and me after her. And the ghost after you, I suppose. No, sir. The ghost vanished in a flame of fire. Now, Maguire, don't try gig lamps and flames of fire on me. You're making all this up. Jove, I believe you're the specter yourself. Me, sir? Is it myself, then, that's a play-acting ghost in your honor's thinking? Mm, what your purpose is, I can't guess. Stealing Lieutenant Seaforth's trousers and all that. I'll have a soul, sir. I stole nothing. No, but you're mixed up in some way with their disappearance. It is the ghost, sir. I know it is. I saw it. There isn't any ghost, Maguire. And don't go about frightening my guests with any such tale. That's all for now. Yes, sir. Well, good night, sir. I felt a strong compulsion then to go to the oak room. I wanted to know if Charles was all right. Immediately Maguire had gone, I left my room hurriedly and ran up the short flight of stairs to the oak room. I listened a moment, then rapped loudly on Seaforth's door. Charles! Charles! Yes, who is it? It's I, Tom. Oh, hello. Come in. I, I was just about to turn in. What's up? You all right? Of course. Why? Well, Carolyn's told me about this ghostly visitor of yours. Look here. You haven't seen him tonight, have you? No, no, no. Forget it, Tom. I'll make out. Don't bother about me. Go on to bed. All right. Cheerio, old man. Just wanted to make sure the goblins hadn't got you. Good night. And then... The very next morning, as I was shaving, my door was flung open and in burst Charles. Inglesby, this is now past a joke. Where are my trousers? Good grief, Charles. What's the idea of yelling at me? You've, you, you've made me cut my chin. Oh, confound your stupid chin. Another pair of trousers are gone again. <laughs> oh, heavens, this is too good. Don't tell me the ghost got the regimentals, too. Laugh if you will. They're gone. Now, I've looked everywhere. What have you done with my clothes? I... Charles, I'm as mystified as you are. In all seriousness, Tom, aren't you putting over one of your famous hoaxes? I swear to you, I have no hand in this skullduggery. Well, then your ancestor's ghost has, and I've had all I can stand. Now, you'll simply have to lend me a pair of your trousers. Well, take all my trousers. Get out of here. You're in no mood to talk sense. All right, as you so politely put it, I'll get out. And in your trousers. In spite of the ties that hold me here, I'm leaving, Captain, today. A uh, seaport. Uh, wait a moment. Now, I was really afraid that Charles' mind was unhinged. I dressed hurriedly and rushed downstairs. Hearing noises in the library, I, I went quietly to the door and listened. Darling, please don't leave for my sake, please. Carolyn, I, I can't stay, I tell you. As surely as I love you, that spectral anatomy came to my room last night, grinned in my face and again walked off with my trousers. Obviously, Charles, it's an insane trick. If it is a trick. What do you mean? I've decided it all has to do with the ownership of Tapton. What? Yes. As you and Tom both said, I am your cousin. I have been in foreign lands. But I'm not claiming Tapton. One of you is trying by inhuman means to frighten me to death. Poison. Yes, mental poison. But you won't get away with it. You won't. Stop, darling. Stop. How can you believe such things? Oh, Tom, I'm so glad you were listening. Talk to him, please. Charles, Charles. Oh, man, you're so wrong. Why, you're my oldest friend and Carolyn loves you. You know that. Now, come on. Forget these black thoughts. Go for a walk and, and let the sun and the wind drive this fog from your mind. Please, Charles, don't talk any more about leaving... Let's fight this thing out together. I... I don't know what's got into me. Very well, Carolyn. I'll stay. That's fine. Don't worry, Carolyn, dear. I'll try to be a model guest. See you at lunch then, darling. Oh, Tom, isn't it awful? Whatever would we do? I do love him so. I was mad clear through and determined to scotch this ghost business once and for all. I knew that the oak room had a secret cupboard in the paneling, so that night I decided I must hide there and spy on Charles. I slipped away from my guests and, tiptoeing through the dark gloom of the oak room, I, I groped my way into the closet. Suddenly my, my hands touched soft human flesh. <gasps> Good Lord. Carolyn. Tom, you scared me so. Oh, we had the same idea, huh? Yes, to protect Charles. Well, of course. But uh, we may have a long wait, sis. I won't mind. Shh, yes. I think I hear him coming. Oh, Tom, I'm so scared. Quiet, quiet. Chin up, old girl. Charles 
felt himself ready for bed, started to take off his trousers, then suddenly put them on again and flung himself into bed. He had left the night lamp on, which was lucky, as thus we could see more easily. After waiting for what seemed ours, Callan suddenly clutched my arm. Look, he's sitting up. Shall we speak? No. No, not yet. He's turning this way. Good Lord, he's asleep. Yes. His eyes are wide open, but they stare senselessly, like dead eyes. He's out of bed. Huh? What did you see looking for? He's got a torch. Why, he's looking at himself in the mirror. Tom, he's going to the secret staircase. He's opening the door. Come along, we've got to follow him. Not too closely. Hurry, hurry, please. We hurried after him down the stairs and out to the postern gate. We saw him enter the glen, and then as we came closer, there was Charles with a spade, digging. Whatever is he doing? Digging a large hole. The earth is soft. He's been digging here before. Look, he's removing his trousers and... and burying them. killed him, though I had hit him hard and then I realized. We called for help and carried him to the great hall. He was still unconscious when Dr. Austin arrived. We waited anxiously during his examination. Finally, the doctor came towards us. Well, Tom, my young lieutenant is coming around nicely. Oh, what a relief. Oh, doctor, is he going to be all right? Of course, my dear. Then it was show shock, doctor? Not exactly. I think that head wound and the fever combined to give his subconscious overactive control of his mind. And when I hit him? Best thing you could have done. You put that subconscious in its place. Well, I think it's safe to say that he won't sleepwalk anymore. Oh. Look at Charles. Oh. He's sitting up. What? Where? What? Why are you all staring? Why am I here? Oh, oh my jaw. Don't try to speak, dear. You're all right now. Well, I should say I was. I why, I feel as if a load had been lifted from my heart. Oh, oh, oh I remember my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Charles, you've been busy burying trousers. In neat layers, riding breeches, shorts, and even those beautiful regimentals. <laughs> <laughs> then I've been haunting myself. Yes, dearest, you are the specter of Tafton. <laughs> oh, my love, can you ever bring yourself to marry a specter? Darling... I love ghosts. <laughs> oh, I begin to catch on. Wedding bells are in the offing. Yes, and with my blessing. But Charles, if ever again you feel inclined to jump out of bed and ramble out of doors, there's one thing I'd like to suggest. W what's that, old boy? I recommend that Carolyn wear the trousers. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have heard the immortal tale, The Spectre of Tappington. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Once again, next time, for another immortal tale.